All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions. I want to thank Greg for coming to the Made Our Forum. And unfortunately, Michelle had a family emergency, so she can't be here tonight, so I'm taking over for her for tonight. Uh, first item is um, the roll call. Rebecca? Yes. Ashfield. Here. Bernardstown? Here. Buckler? Charlemont? Coleraine? Here. Conway? Here. Deerfield, Urban, here. Hill, here. Greenfield, Holly, here. Heath, here. Leverett, Lydon, Monroe, Montague, New Salem, here. Northfield, Orange, Rowe, here. Shelburne, Shutesbury, here. Sunderland, Warwick. Wendell Waitley. Here. Bill Perlman. Here. Jada Puccio. Here. Jim Basford. Here. We have 15 members and a sad 34.67% of the weighted vote of the total membership in attendance. So we have a simple form, but we cannot do any financial votes today. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, first item on our agenda is the uh, the reorganization. Uh, since the uh, FERCOG has a tradition, although not policy, of maintaining the slate of officers for two years, uh, Jay uh, DiPucchio and Linda uh, proposed that the um, fiscal 2020 slate remain the same as the fiscal 2019 slate, which is uh, the council chair, Michelle Giarusso from Leiden, uh, myself as the vice chair, uh, Secretary Kevin Fox and Colerain, the council appointment to the executive committee, Kevin Fox, Colerain, the uh, council appointment to the executive committee, Mayor Bill Morton from Greenfield, and his appointment will be for six months, uh, which will be through the end of his term, and then the council will reappoint a new member uh, to the executive committee at its January meeting. Uh, I would ask the council to, uh, if, are there any nominations from the floor? I would ask the council uh, to uh, approve the nominations. Do we have a, a motion? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is to adopt the uh, minutes of the January 24th meeting. Has everybody had a chance to review the minutes? 
Any uh, additions or amendments to the minutes? Make a motion to accept the minutes as written. We have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda, uh, we have council updates. Uh, the next meetings uh, of the council are October 17th, January 23rd, that's 2020, and April 16th, 2020. Uh, all meetings are held here in the Transit Center. Um, Jane Pierce from Orange, one of our new members, is not here, so I won't welcome her. Um, I'll welcome her when she gets here, whatever that is. <laughs> Uh, we have some bad news. Uh, you all know Beth Adams, uh, FERCOG representative from Leverett, passed away this spring after a courageous battle with cancer. Beth was a longtime activist for peace, social justice, and the environment. Although she was not on the council for much more than a year, she offered outside of the box thinking to our group and will be missed. <coughs> our committees are full, with the exception of the personnel committee, which currently has three vacancies. That committee occasionally works with the staff to review the personnel policy handbook and the supervisor's manual as needed, act as a grievance appeal board for the FERCOG, and review employee reclassification requests from program managers. The board also makes recommendations to the finance committee regarding competitive market cost of living increases during the budget season. The council chair appoints members of the personnel committee, so if you have an interest in getting involved in that way, please contact Michelle or our director, our exec executive director, Linda. Okay, our next item on the agenda, the executive committee update. Jay. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, in our meeting since January, we learned about the state's new short-term rental Airbnb law focusing a uh, short-term rental Airbnb law, focusing particularly on the ways in which towns can benefit financially from the new law through taxation, licensing, and penalty fees, uh, and can choose to limit growth by creating a cap on those numbers, and can make adjustments to zoning to meet each individual municipality's needs and visions. We considered and subsequently appointed two candidates to five-year terms on the Franklin County Regional Housing and Redevelopment Authority Board of Commissioners. Um, of particular note, and I'm sure there will be detail later, we've learned and discussed the progress of the emergency communications system migration to the state system. Um, uh, Linda, I'm sure, will have some specifics later, but um, I just want to note that uh, our, our director has done yeoman work moving this agenda along for the towns in Franklin County. Uh, we voted to draft a letter to FERC asking for intervener status and for further migration mitigation measures for the Bear Swamp Hydroelectric Project's final license application. That's something sort of near my heart. We've learned of Hampshire uh, County Council of Government's imminent closing and considered the programs that the COG might reasonably take over uh, from them to improve that would uh, concomitantly improve services to Franklin County towns um, while assisting those Hampshire County municipalities. After reviewing favorable financial risk and benefit analysis, uh, the committee was cautiously comfortable with the decision to take over portions of the Hampshire COGS procurement program for at least a year while staff determined if the program is financially viable uh, and a benefit to the Franklin County communities that, that we believe it will be. And uh, we convened as the Economic Development District Governing Board to discuss and accept the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy Annual Report, the last of the reports in the five-year cycle. The EDD Board also voted to approve changes to its structure and procedural rules, much streamlining their process and appointing nominated uh, members to the SEDS committee. Thank you, Jay. Uh, any, any questions or comments for Jay? No? Okay, thank you. Uh, Linda, you're up. 
Hi everyone. Um, much to tell you because we didn't meet in April. Um, on page three of the council updates, we start with advocacy boards, commissions, and committees. And one of the things that the COG staff do is represent Franklin County on a variety of boards and committees and commissions um, across the state. And some new ones have have new appointments have occurred. Jessica is now on the Mass Development New Market Advisory Tax Credit Advisory Board, which will assess and approve new market tax credit projects across the state. Kimberly was, was appointed to the Franklin Conservation District Board of Supervisors. Phoebe, um, as you know, has been on the local and regional public health, um, no, I'm sorry, has been sitting on a special commission on local and regional public health, and she um, did a huge amount of work con convincing Massachusetts and working with the legislature to change how local public health is, is provided in Massachusetts, and we are supporting the legislation that has been crafted. Um, and I hope you took time to look through the annual report to see the long list of commissions and committees and boards that we sit on representing the Franklin County. It's one of the things we are most proud of. Um, Cannabis Control Commission has come out with some new changes and regulations. We are going to be drafting some testimony about um, and commenting on those new regulations. Phoebe, is this one of the things that could be one of the local officials workshop series in the fall? Uh, yeah, except that they're only taking comments until August 15th. So yeah, No, I mean yeah. the, uh, once they're... Oh, once they're done, absolutely we will be on it. That and the um, um, CBD changes, CBD hemp changes as well. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Another thing that I hope that you saw, and if you haven't, go on our website, is Kimberly has just finished a framework for resilience, and it is a climate change plan and resiliency framework for the 14, 16, how many towns? 14 towns in the Deerfield River watershed. It's the first time that a, that, uh, a climate change plan has been created in Massachusetts that has thought about the watershed as a whole, and so the recommendations work with every single town and yet collectively would make significant, um, make the region significantly more resilient and is a model for the rest of Massachusetts. Um, the COG is leading the Census 2020 Complete Count Committee. I assume you know, if you don't know, this will be the first time that the census is going to be an online survey. And um, so we are working to deal with the ramifications of that. The first thing that will happen is that postcards will be sent out by the Census Bureau letting people know how to do, how to respond. So the first thing we'll do related to that is work with our local police stations so they're familiar with the postcard so that if residents call and say, I think I'm getting spam, our police can say it's not spam. We'll be working with our libraries and our school districts to, to help those people that either don't have a computer or are comfortable on the computer or don't have broadband so that we will have census response dates throughout, um, throughout the couple of months that the census is open and available. And we'll also be doing other marketing and other things. We encourage you all to get very involved in this. Um, billions and billions and billions of federal dollars are distributed by population. And so we need to make sure that every single person is counted in Franklin County. My understanding was that the feds were going to send paper copies to people who responded to the online one anyway. <coughs> yes. But that makes the whole process much more expensive and, and it would be better <coughs> to just respond as quickly as possible online. We got a new $200,000 Brownfields grant, so if you feel you have any contaminated sites, please contact Peggy or Jessica in our planning department. That is, um, a, that is the first step to redevelopment of uh, economic development potential properties. 
Jay has talked about the expansion of the collective purchasing program. We have hired um, the Hampshire Cogs chief procurement officer and the bids that we have taken that we will do for Hampshire County are highway products and services, fuel, and a few other miscellaneous bids. Anyone have questions on that? Okay. Phoebe, you want to talk about the regional animal control officer? Yes. Um, we have a nice group of towns working together. You can see their friendly faces on page five. Um, with the sheriff's office uh, to uh, create a regional animal control officer position. Interviews are underway. There were 75 applicants. Um, and yeah, and um, this is going to be a I guess I can't, well, I think the main thing I want to say is we're really lucky to have the sheriff step up and offer to cost share this program and host it out of the regional kennel and provide the fan. Um, so um, this is a really wonderful model that I hope um, is going to launch in the very near future. Thanks. Um, there is a lot to tell you about the Franklin County Emergency Communication System and really all of it is good. I am super happy to say all of it is good. Um, since we last met, the, uh, the, I can't remember if the project had moved from the Executive Office of Public Safety to the Executive Office of Technology Safety, had that occurred? The reason that is good is because uh, the Secretary, the Executive Office of Technology Safety and Security is a new cabinet level secretariat the secretary of that cabinet level um, agency was our strongest proponent of moving us over to the state's um, emergency communication system. So having him back in charge of this is good for us. So what they have asked, what they asked us uh, several months ago now was for an equipment inventory. We worked with our fire chiefs, police chiefs, EMS, and all of the other units within the FCECS to come up with a good and solid inventory that was agreed upon by all of the chiefs. We submitted that to the executive office of, at that time, Public Safety and Security. They called us into Framingham. We went through that and assured them that it was a solid, realistic, conservative, not inflated, inventory. After that, they asked us to come up with what we thought a migration, a sensible migration schedule would be, and we worked with, again, the Chiefs Associations and the Oversight Committee to really think about what would be the phases of the migration. Um, and with that, we were called into Boston, and they have been doing an enormous amount of work to look at our transition. I think in part because they um, want to assess the, the liability to themselves by us moving over to the system, and that's fine. They should think about that. But they looked at five different criteria, and, I ha and they're on the bottom of page. For the investments and upgrades to the statewide system, the coverage will be better than we have now with our failing Franklin County Emergency Communication System. So we checked that box. They then looked at capacity and the addition of Franklin County on the uh, expanding capacity of the co-mirrors. The statewide system um, is small, so that capacity is not an issue. We got that checked. The subscriber units, um, there are two different, they want the subscriber units to work, both analog and digital, both before and after the full expansion, and that results in two different radios, a lower cost Kenwood model and a higher cost Motorola model, and there's good news even related to that because the cost differential between the two when we first started talking about this was somewhere in the range of $1,000. They think with competitive procurement that the cost differential will be more like for $600.
and they told us that the plan will be that based on that equipment inventory that we submitted, every town will get an allowance for radios, and the allowance will equal the inventory times the cost of the Kenwood radios, the lower cost option. And then if the towns and the state will pay for those, those will be free, and free is a very good price. But if a town wants to upgrade to Motorola, they will have the opportunity to, and that would be at that at the municipality's cost. So that's how we're dealing with subscriber units. Number four, functionality. In the engineering study that they're doing, they are looking at, number one, Franklin County was included in the engineering study, and number two, the issue of paging was included in the engineering study. Remember that we've talked about this before, that the Comeres expansion was originally designed to be just a state police system. This, by moving Franklin County over, it needs to meet the needs of all of our first responders. So in terms of functionality, they're examining the paging system. They feel that they have a solution or will have a solution for the paging system, but what they've made clear to us is that until that so until they are confident that all issues have been resolved and that the paging is working and in building coverage has been addressed, that we will be required to keep the Franklin County Emergency Communication System up and running until then. And so that they will put that in the agreement with every town, that there is a requirement that we maintain the our system until they can tell us that it's time. And then finally, um, they are going to create an MOU. The MOU will have standards and protocols that every user has to abide by. So with that, we expect the transition to occur very soon. The engineering study is anticipated to be done in August. The secretary is so confident that he has good news that he personally will be coming out for a September 5th public forum. Um, don't know the time, it will be GCC, it will be September 5th. He feels that they will have enough answers that uh, any remaining questions and concerns, if not answered, um, they will have have a plan to get it. The funding allocation for the towns, uh, that's our choice. Once we get the amount multiplied by the cost of the Kenwood, but we can use that on whatever compatible radio equipment we want. So if we wanted to buy dual band APXs and fewer of them, we could do that, right? I don't know the answer to that because I don't know about the standards adherence. I'll find out who's saying. Okay. Linda, are you planning on having another meeting uh, with the town and stuff? Yeah, that's September fifth. That's September. That is the meeting. Yep. Oh, okay. okay sure. Um, the other thing that we are doing at the request of the mayor, so we are we are advancing the timing of this right now. Right now, the Franklin Regional Council of Governments has an MOU with every town in Franklin County about operation and maintenance of the Franklin County Emergency Communication System. Um, the mayor has asked us to redraft that agreement because it has gone on longer than the charter allows him, the Greenfield Charter allows him to sign contracts for. And since we have this information and since the current agreement has a one-year withdrawal provision from the FCCS, we are going to accelerate the redrafting of that MOU but also make it clear that a town can still withdraw from the FCCS, but if they withdraw from the FCCS, they're also withdrawing from the COMIRS, the statewide interoperability system, because of their condition that we maintain FCCS until the full migration has occurred. So we are drafting that now, and we'll get that out. Uh, it will be a month or so. The Oversight Committee met today, and just before the meeting, I thought of a few things we should add to that. 
So. So once the, if the transition goes through, will our relationship then be between the towns and the state or between some county entity and the state? I mean, once you get the paging thing worked out, then at that point, will the relationship just be bilateral between the towns and the state, or will there be a county intermediary at that point? We haven't really discussed that. Every question you're asking, I don't have an answer for what I'm saying, so I'll add it on my list of... Okay, that's yeah, another one. Governance of that is one of the questions that we have already listed and hoping to get an Any questions on that? See you September 5th. Um, only other thing is we are working on the lo local official workshop series for fall and winter. Please contact Phoebe if you have any suggestions or, or needs. And I hope you saw the bicycle safety campaign on the billboards and on the buses all throughout Franklin County. I hope you read about the Franklin County North Plumbin Community Health Needs Assessment that was led by our Partnership for Youth and was an excellent presentation. And I hope to tell you soon that we have a date for passenger rail expansion. It's supposed to be August 30th. We'll see if it's August 30th. Thank you, Linda. Any questions for Linda? Okay. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Jim, do you have a planning board uh, update for us? Just a couple of things to uh, go over. The uh, planning board reviewed and provided input on the regional transportation plan and the comprehensive economic development strategy, which is always great to say. <laughs> and uh, the planning board participated in a listening session sponsored by the Nature Conservancy and facilitated by our staff to identify potential solutions that rural residents would be most interested in pursuing to combat climate change by reducing emissions generated by the transportation <coughs> sector. Uh, there's like a 30 page uh, white paper report that uh, Peggy had. If you're interested, I'm sure we could get it to you. But uh, that was quite informative and, and great ideas that uh, uh, posted. And follow up. See what happens. Thank you, Jim. Any questions for Jim? Okay, our next thing, uh, update is from uh, Bill Perlman, the Personnel Committee. Yes, Personnel Committee has actually met. Um, if anybody's interested in joining it, just be aware that we don't need all that often. So it's less intrusive than many others. Um, the closing of the Hampshire Cog has ripple effects through both towns, and um, we had approved two employment positions, created job descriptions, and created, but as part of the descriptions, they, the job definition was contingent upon our making use of those people, so only one uh, has been realized, and that's for the uh, that's for the procurement program. It's one of the functions of the HCOG that has not been covered by other organizations. The jobs were sort of divided up a bunch, and that's the one that had the best fit with us. But it's important that we have somebody who is familiar with the HCOG way of doing it, which is a different approach than the one we have. So, and also somebody who has relationships with the Hampshire County towns. So it's a uh, benefit to us, uh, we think, to take it over and definitely to have somebody who knows how things operate in Hampshire at least for the first year until we can bring it under one umbrella. And that's it. Thank you, Bill. Any questions? Well, for Bill? there will be um, 
we're going to have a first reading of a change to our travel policies. It's not quite ready. Um, That's generous of you. I forgot to send it. Thanks, Bill. That was generous. I'm trying to <laughs> it's not like we have protect <laughs> my director here. So um, we'll, we'll do that in October. What else did you? That's it. Okay. Any questions for Bill? Thank you, Bill. Our next up update is on the <coughs> finance committee. Lynn? Um, finance committee had met on Tuesday. Um, we were discussing the end of year, FY19. Um, it's been a good year for the FERCOG. Uh, preliminary results is suggesting that revenues will exceed expenses by a healthy margin. Good thing. Uh, the general fund and all fee for service municipal programs are expected to close with all expenses covered. The Finance Committee at our meeting on Tuesday uh, took very small budget amendments, mainly transferring things from one line to another within a budget just because that's what's required of us uh, for fiscal year 2019. Um, we had intended to bring forward some motions for some adjustments to the FY20 budget, but because we don't have a financial forum, we won't be doing that. And those basically are because of um, the collective purchasing program and the cooperative public health service program actually enlarging. So it's a good thing. Uh, but in order to enlarge, you need a larger budget, so we would have to do some amendments to the budgets, which in turn would be covered by revenues from those uh, departments. Um, so that pretty much is about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to thank Claire. She's done a marvelous job. We're, we're organizing the budget a little bit, doing little tweaks to it to make it easier to understand as we go through. So Claire has been great at doing all of that. So I thank her and Linda for all their hard work. Thank you, Lynn. Any questions for Lynn? Okay. Uh, next item is the uh, special presentation from Linda on the, uh, the Rural Policy Plan draft. So, um, do you mind clicking? Nope. Already so, mm -hmm. I, if you remember, I, I gave a presentation, I don't know, a year ago with a lot of really depressing maps, mm -hmm. remember? Yeah. Well, now we're moving on to how are we going to change the dynamics in rural Massachusetts, and we're creating a Massachusetts Rural Policy Plan. Um, this is just some background information just to rem remind you. Created by the legislature in 2015, its mission is to enhance the economic vitality of rural communities in Massachusetts. Um, lots of different appointments, and, mass and rural, next slide, is defined legislatively as under 500 people per square mile, which is not as rural as we think, but the good news is that means it's got a lot of legislators supporting us. So it's 170 communities. Mm -hmm. So 59% of the land area, 13% of the population. So we're writing a Massachusetts Rural Poly a Policy Plan that will guide the work of the Rural Policy Advisory Commission. It's intended to be to educate urban Massachusetts, but be also be informative to rural Massachusetts, to be useful to the governor, the legislature, and state agencies and to reflect and be supportive by the rural municipalities. Um, I will say that because the Franklin Regional Council of Governments is facilitating the writing of the plan, of the statewide plan, Franklin County is very well represented in the plan right now. So, um, I think the next slide is timeline. I think I've talked to you about this before. The Rural Caucus, the Rural Caucus is um, a group of legislators that voluntarily identify themselves as legislators interested in rural issues. It's made up of 28 legislators right now. They have asked us to have the rural plan done for their upcoming legislative sessions. So we are trying to basically have the plan done by the end of August to roll it out in the September, October timeframe. 
So here are the focus areas. There are 15 focus areas, and we have assigned authorship of the 15 focus areas to agencies around rural Massachusetts. The Franklin Regional Council of Governments had lead responsibility for broadband and cell coverage. We have taken um, economic development, housing, municipal board and staffing constraints, municipal financial staffing constraints, public health and health care, reversing population trends, water and sewer infrastructure and workforce needs, which would explain why Franklin County is so <laughs> well represented. So I've got slides on, we can talk about any of these and get your ideas and thoughts on any of these, but I've got slides on the ones in bold. And um, the draft focus areas, 14, no, 13 of 15 are posted on the COG website. Now is the time for you to read them and get to us if you have any changes or other ideas or if you completely missed something. There is no way that we will have caught it all. But we've held stakeholder meetings throughout Massachusetts on all of the different focus areas in hopes that we've done a pretty good job. So starting with reversing population trends, um, the population forecasts that are being used for plans in Massachusetts are projecting that the 2040, 2040 population in Massachusetts will see an 18.5% 18 decline in population on the Cape, 2.7% decline in Franklin County, 2.4% decline in Berkshire County, and a 31.6% increase in Suffolk County. Suffolk mm -hmm. County is Boston mm -hmm. only. 31.6% mm -hmm. increase in population. So this is a huge one for us because if these numbers come true, not only will it be nearly impossible to live in Boston in terms of traffic congestion and housing prices, but it's also going to be nearly impossible to live in rural Massachusetts because we won't have the people we need to function and operate our businesses and our towns. So, um, here's our recommendations. Number one is to create the Massachusetts Office of Rural Policy. Uh, the recommendation here is that this would be a cabinet level, cabinet level position so that rural agenda and rural issues are always in the forefront of Massachusetts decision making. We also think that there needs to be a statewide land use strategy. We are very proactive. We are, um, we are very reactive as a state. We create um, funding programs and address issues after they are problems rather than thinking forward. And we really think we should have a strategy that really tries to have a more sensible, logical disbursement of population in a way that balances character, carbon sequestration, open space protection, economic development, etc. Um, Maine and Vermont are ahead of us because they've already recognized that they are also growing older and declining in population. And they have specific programs to attract people to their states. Maine has a student loan forgiveness <laughs> program. If you move to Maine, they will cover a percent of your student loans. Um, Vermont has a, re a remote worker location subsidy. Uh, $10,000 over two years will be given to people that relocate to Vermont. Vermont is also doing um, a marketing program that if if someone is coming to Vermont for a vacation, they are encouraged to come on Friday and stay through Monday and meet with local businesses to see how their business could fit into Vermont. And they also have a centralized employment listing for all jobs in Vermont and in Maine. Both, both of them have that. Our other ideas, next one please, on this one is that we need to expand racial and ethnic diversity in rural Massachusetts. If you remember one of the slides, where Massachusetts is growing is in the eastern part of Massachusetts, and it's not with babies being born, it's with foreign-born people coming to Massachusetts and only staying in the Boston area. We have to find a way to be more welcoming, to bring more 
diversity to rural Massachusetts. Um, and a recommendation that has come up in at least five of the focus areas is really looking at a rurality factor mm -hmm. in funding formulas for things like Chapter 90, Chapter 70, other state aid, because it's becoming really clear that part of our problem is that we can't invest in our infrastructure, in our, con in our economy, in our schools to attract people because so many of our formulas are population-based, so we get too little. There's a lot of really cool young professional societies in rural Massachusetts, especially Cape Cod, that are really recognizing that they, they are the young people. They will be the people to attract young people to their regions. And so the Cape Cod Young Professional Society is doing some great things to really show that there are jobs, there is a social life, there is lots to do on Cape Cod. And we've already talked about this, we need to make sure everyone is counted. And this is the last one because hopefully we'll be successful with everything else, but if we're not, we need to prepare for the fact that we're getting older as a region. So that's reversing population trends. Did we miss anything? Of course we did. No, I'd just like to add one that I've noticed maybe because I'm in school committee context a lot. You know, the education systems, in a way, our schools have become a victim of their own success. And what do I mean by that? Well, they like to brag. And yes, we're sending people to Stanford here and there. Well, how many of them come back? Mm -hmm. You got five great colleges right down the road, another few more in Springfield. And then you have one in Greenfield. Uh, the schools should be partnering and having incentive programs working with the local colleges because the talent that goes there is more likely to stay in the area than the people who go to California to go to Texas, not knocking those places, but once people go there, they're a lot more likely to stay there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have some, if you've got a strong support for the educational institutions in this area, you're more likely to keep your people around. Um. And you remind me of one that I forgot to put in here. The other thing that we've talked about here in Franklin County is the fact that people that Hussein is right that a lot of our kids go away from college and then go to a city for a little yeah. while. Yeah. But once they get married and have children, they often want to come back to a rural area. It may not be our rural area, but they want to come back to a quieter, more peaceful way of life to raise their children. And how can we make them come back to our rural area? And so that, so that, do we try to keep our kids here, or do we try to bring them back when they're 25 or between 25 and 35? I, I think we we talk about it all the time in different committees, and broadband is one. I mean, yep. if you left the, left the area, and you might go to another rural area because you can still work at home, but you can't do that here. And if there's no industry here, it's hard to come back as well. <coughs> It's a, you know, which comes first. Yeah. In fact, um, we ha we've had a lot of discussion and in the crafting of this plan whether this is even its own focus area. Because if you're successful with everything else, you've changed the population trends. And so that you're not going to get people here unless we have housing or jobs or broadband. And so then does this become a chapter or not? And we decided to keep it because there are so many interesting and good recommendations that would, if we have everything else, would also help. But I totally hear you. Well, it's hard to get diversity. They're staying in mm -hmm. Boston because that's where their opportunities are for coming over here. Mm -hmm. If they come in here, their opportunity is, there isn't any. Right. To be honest. Yep. Should I go on? Yeah. I could talk about this all night long. So you guys can stop me at any time. So sewer and water is, you know this, there's limited sewer and water infrastructure in rural areas, so that limits housing and commercial development. The cost of system construction and ongoing maintenance is hard for rural areas. It's so hard to find operators of small systems, especially small systems in very remote areas. We know that 
There's particular problems on the Cape and the North Shore where private wells are going brackish or there's um, uh, some phosphorus problems on the Cape and Islands. And they're having trouble finding new sources of potable water and sewage disposal costs and sludge disposal costs are increasing and because we have to truck further distances. So recommendations we have here, and I wish Jane Pierce was here, I'm going to send her this chapter because she um, tried to retire from DEP and they wouldn't let her. So um, the first one is to provide additional state funding for rural water and sewer infrastructure needs. And you can see a list of them. One of the huge ones that we have to talk about is that DEP lost an enormous number of staff during the early retirement offer about five, six years ago maybe, and they've never restaffed. And so part of the issue we have in rural Massachusetts and throughout Massachusetts is there just simply isn't enough staff at DEP to meet this, the Commonwealth's needs. Um, as a result of that, DEP is, is slow to allow new and innovative alternative systems to address rural issues, whether that's small package treatment plants or different technologies for septic systems. Um, and we need more local assistance more and more operator training so that we can have operators for the systems that we have. Um, the, the next one is fairly similar. We need to improve governance and operation. We need DEP to support the sharing of operators, and, and we are working with DEP on that now, trying to work with DEP so that even though the systems are slightly different, that there still can be a way to share an operator. Um, and then we were able to go to the Massachusetts Alternate Septic System Test Center when we were out on a meeting in Falmouth, and so cool. It is so cool. So they, what this is, is they have um, the Barnstable County's jails, wastewater is pumped to this 40 acre site, and there's 40 or 50 different types of innovative systems being tested at once, either by Barnstable County or by people who are, by, by septic providers who want to see if their technology will work. Um, we weren't, it was a pouring rain day, and we weren't allowed to go into their office because the guy's um, foot fell through the floor oh my God. just the day before, and so their, their office conditions are so bad and their ability to do things is so limited because it's really funded mostly by competitive grants in the Barnes, in Barnstable County. And so we could be doing so much more as a state if we really acknowledged the asset that that place is. I, I just want to comment that, that DEP and Ashfield have both burned very badly with a so-called innovative system 20 years ago. Um, and so <clears throat> I know the DEP has become a little gun shy of these fancy new things, Ashfield is stuck, probably could be the most expensive system in the world. Plant watering system in the world. Yeah, I mean, 7.2 million, 464 <coughs> users. It's impressive. Still doesn't work well. So um, staffing and board membership challenges, the, the, there is no education and training pipeline for many important roles. We have challenges in attracting people to rural areas um, because they're often part-time jobs or we just simply can't afford to pay them a competitive wage. Uh, we are relying on volunteers in an era of reduced volunteerism. We have a we are facing an enormous baby boomer retirement wave, especially in municipal government, and we are struggling to have first responders. So what are we gonna do about that? This was Phoebe's chapter. You wanna talk about it? 
Well, we had great input from tons of different folks across the, the rural mass, and um, some of the policy recommendations were a bunch of different uh, suggestions around how to improve training programs. There are a bunch of professional organizations that have trainings, but they maybe don't offer them frequently, or you already have to be a municipal employee to qualify for the training. Yeah. So then how do you get in? Um, and, uh, and then, of course, there are vast swaths where there is no training program. Um, there were a bunch of suggestions about ways we could connect um, workforce training in colleges with municipal um, trainings and um, obviously the usual increased use of online training as broadband becomes more, more frequent. So there was a lot of different suggestions around training. Um, so one of the recommendations is to pass that um, piece of legislation that you all I'm sure know about, about allowing the driver of an ambulance not to be an EMT. Um, and then there was a lot of interest in whether there could be a way to relax state retiree work restrictions, especially if you were willing to work in rural underserved communities, because um, there are folk that, you know, there, there's a long history of people being circuit riders in this uh, state, and maybe we could continue to work with folks who have retired if they were allowed to, allowed to not be penalized for it. Not be yeah, penalized yeah, for it. Yes, for exactly. Um, again, the, 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 if you haven't seen the local government workforce skills gap report, it addressed many of these similar things. It was a very nice document put together by the lieutenant governor. So um, we have that in there. Uh, there's information in it about some ideas like citizen academies. Um, again, I think you probably all have heard of these citizens academies, but essentially <coughs> they are a way to provide an entree into local government for people who could be board members or commission members, and that's something that some big communities do and do really well, and it, it can be a great way to get new, fresh blood into town government in terms of volunteer roles, but it's harder to pull off when you're doing it in a small town. <coughs> are there ways to do that regionally? Are there ways to support the development of that curriculum? Um, there's civics education ideas. There is actually a new civics education requirement in Massachusetts, but we're not clear on how much of that is required to be about local government, and we'd like to make sure that, that it is. Um, and then um, there was interest in having folks uh, have it be a little easier to transition town roles from elected to appointed, um, which would make it easier to share positions with neighboring towns, which is obviously one of the major takeaways. A lot of people um, expressed wanting more help learning how to share things. A lot of people in other parts of the rural Massachusetts don't maybe have as much experience sharing as you all do and, um, and would like more help from folks in doing that and in funding the startup of it um, and building shared trust and governance together. Um, and then there are, um, there is sort of this chicken and egg, the final bullet there is about, you know, if you don't have a lot of workforce credential requirements, a position doesn't appear to be very valuable, which doesn't make somebody necessarily want to be in it, right? On the one hand, you might think, well, having workforce credential requirements makes things, makes it even harder to attract somebody to the position. On the other hand, we see in the public health world how the fact that there are so few workforce requirements makes it kind of not clear that it's a good it's a good career to go into. So how do you elevate these things as professional careers and encourage people to come into them? Uh, pertaining oh. to that last one. Yeah. Of course, the Mass Collector Treasurers has had certification for, oh, uh, since 1985. Yeah. For collectors and treasurers. We have been trying for the last few years and filing legislation to enable us to not certify, but give the, the certification stipend to the assistant collectors and treasurers who are now able to get certified, and we can't get it through the legislature. It's not cutesy oh. enough. It's very, not, very frustrating. Not, not cutesy enough. It's can not, you, you know, they just, it's not, it's not priority. It's right. not anything. We've come close, but we've never been able to get it through. Can you and send us the copy of either Linda or me, a yeah. copy of the legisl oh, last, sure. last legislation or whatever? Oh, sure. No, we've got it on file right now. You know, so, we're yeah. summarizing these for you here, yeah. high level, but we're also keeping a pretty exhaustive, tiny list right. of things people said about, you know, okay. different certificate programs that you have to already be in the position to get. Yeah, well, we're, yeah, that's, and incidentally, with the accountant, that changed two years ago, finally. Good. Finally. That you no longer have to be an accountant in order to, a town accountant in order to go to their school. Finally. <laughs> yes, sir. You have no idea how frustrating that is. 
I well, want to commend you for putting in the part about the limited volunteers and the emergency services. And just to expand on that point, you know, ambulance response times, that's something people pay attention to when they move to an area, especially if they are older or they have kids or medical condition or any combination of the above. Uh, I know of some, I could name you specific people who made a choice not to be in Holly <coughs> because of the distance and the limited medical interventions that were available to them mm -hmm. in that place. Uh, so I think it's very important that we work on trying to support our volunteers as much as we can, maybe even getting some state funding aimed at rural emergency services because that's coming out of town budgets. Mm -hmm. But another point is that you may not be aware, or you may be aware, but EMTs in Massachusetts, a lot of these medical calls turn into paramedic calls because the EMTs in Mass can't do a fraction of what the EMTs in Vermont or New Hampshire can do under their wilderness protocols. Well, I look out my window and I don't see anything that's particularly different than Vermont or New Hampshire or Maine in terms of the distance from definitive care and the issues that occur. And if we could start pushing for a little bit more flexibility for the staff to do some very basic things, uh, that would be helpful because at this point, the interventions the EMT can engage in are not too much above what a first responder can engage in and are far below what an equivalent position can do in Vermont, New Hampshire, or Maine. Super helpful. Thank you. That, 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 would, be, that would be a good one for best practices, the mm. yeah. looking at the Maine and Vermont world. Let's just right. keep copying Maine and Vermont. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and, and there is also a whole chapter on, on sort of public health and health care, and that, that issue comes up in that chapter as well. Yep. Right? Yeah, and the provide funding to increase engagement. Is that you're suggesting through some grant from the state, or are you suggesting that perhaps the communities in the rural? No, the state. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was is actually such a bad idea to think that that this agency could assess a certain amount of money to contribute to that. That's an interesting no idea. Yeah. <laughs> right. If yeah. we are the ones that need <coughs> those people to fill these positions, then we should pay to help. Help that. That's an interesting point. And you also could look at um, DLTA funds, you know, as yeah. something that is already coming to rural areas. And mm -hmm. but then, of course, we're that's using it to solve our. But, but that's a that's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that one came right out of the workforce. Every skills. school yeah. could have like a civics program, as you mm -hmm. suggest, and well, community sure. colleges could have, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? The, um, like UMass has a program for. Like public, public administration, administration kind yeah. of, yeah. 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 You could have a, a GCC, Hampshire, Berkshire, you know. Uh, I mean, this year was, I think, that um, got to be the most number of uncontested elections in Franklin yeah. County that I've ever seen in my yeah. life. I mean, the headline was just yeah. day after day after day was, you know, empty seats, no, no contest. No. One of the things that's, that's happening for uh, instance, uh, the first responders, which used to be when I first took it, an eight-hour course is now 40 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and it could and, go on. And it's, it's an onerous requirement. And then when you get out in the field, as Hussein points out, you really can't do anything. Right. So, um, and that's one of the reasons that have keeping people away. I mean, I'm still on my local fire department past the mandatory age of retirement, but very often it's only the chief and myself that will respond. There's nobody else around. So um, So is your recommendation to not have 40 hours of training? Yeah. Actually, I think they could fit what a first responder needs to know in probably half the time. Bill, could you then do perhaps like a internship or ride along with actual to get some more of the real feel for it and well, you're gonna do, you're gonna do that anyway. Yeah, right? no, but make that a mandatory part of the training. Uh, you wouldn't get enough call volume out okay, here. You just yeah. wouldn't get the volume. Okay. I mean I was just thinking in terms of 
you know, making up for the other hours if in fact they were not needed. Uh, but maybe it's just hands on. They go into a level of detail and a level of redundancy in, in putting this stuff out that is extremely time consuming and some of it you're never going to see. And um, it's just too onerous for a first responder level. When I go out, I'm directing traffic. I'm not running into burning buildings anymore, but it's freeing up somebody who can. So um, I'm very good at it. <laughs> but I'd say that just, I don't know if we're ever going to be able to stop the freight train with uh, the training requirements. It would be nice to see some of it scale back, but at the very least, they should be letting us do what we are trained how to do. The capabilities, so many times, I've come across calls where people haven't done stuff, not because they didn't have the training, not because they didn't have the resources, but because the rules say, in this capacity, you can't do that. We've got a guy in our fire department who's an ex-Army medic. And, uh, he can do a lot of stuff that he can't do. Yeah, that's really there's nice. no recognition of what he, where he comes from, uh, and I think that's that's a, a good point. My husband's a former medic. There's a lot of things he can do, and has done. Well, it's interesting in the other, in, in you know, one of the other in the in the healthcare um, chapter, there is a lot of suggestions around the scope of work. You know, the way in which there are professionals in all of our communities doing different things. Who, if their scope was allowed to be the dental therapist, nurse practitioners in this state need to work under a doctor. They don't need to work under a doctor in New York and Connecticut. We could get a lot more potential help. You know, so there are all of these scope of professional uh, work pieces of legislation that either exist already or could exist. To, to I think it's important to realize why those restrictions are in place. Somebody's protecting something someplace. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have to be cognizant of that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, you only need to sit through one But, but I think that's why Hussein's point of the wilderness protocol. Right, I think totally that's, agree. Yes, I think that's so. how that would be harder to argue with. Right. Yeah. So, last one I think we have tonight is housing. And so the issues are that we have a shortage of affordable and mm -hmm. workforce housing. Our wages are not keeping up with the cost of housing and the cost of transportation. I think I've talked to you before about that there is an index about um, a nationwide index of when you combine housing and transportation costs, what that cost is, and it's enormous in rural Massachusetts. Like 58% of average income can be spent on transportation and housing combined. In comparison, it's much lower in Boston and Springfield, even with Boston's housing prices because they don't have to own a car in Boston. So, um, <coughs> especially in the Berkshires and the Cape and Islands, there's an affordability gap and also just a huge shortage of housing for year-round people. Um, small rural development is at a smaller scale, so we can't reach the economies of scale, and then we are also ineligible for a lot of funding programs because we aren't building enough housing to be competitive with competitive grant programs. So for this one, the recommendations are to support rehabilitation of underutilized, vacant, distressed, and deteriorated properties. And there's a whole bunch of ideas here. A really big one is that rural Massachusetts by and large has an older housing stock than the rest of Massachusetts. Much of our housing is pre-World War II, so affordable, but needs a lot of repair often. And there is a state law that as soon as you hit, as soon as your rehab of a house hits 30% of the value of the house, you are required to bring it fully up to ADA disability standards, which then prevents a lot of rehab from going forward. It prevents developers from doing rehab and from homeowners from doing significant needed rehab. And that would be a legislative change to relax that standard. We also want to revise the Community Scale Housing Initiative. The Community Scale Housing Initiative was created 
Um, DHCD a few years ago was going to do significant changes to CDBG to make, in their opinion, CDBG used more effectively. And rural Massachusetts really said, wow, you're really messing with an important source of funds for us. So they created the Community Scale Housing Initiative, and that is defined to be for small scale development. <laughs> Unfortunately, the only municipality in Massachusetts that is ineligible to apply for it is Boston. And so a small scale development in Worcester is 200 units. A small, a reasonably scale development here is four to 10 and a big development is 25 units in Franklin County. And so the community scale housing initiative that was specifically created for smaller developments, we've never received a grant in Franklin County. So um, there's a lot of rural areas that now have uh, sub-regional housing specialists that are working with the towns to look at their zoning and come up with areas where housing development can occur, can occur to attract developers to how to build, to work with housing authorities, to be part of the housing production system that's really working well on the Cape and other parts of more eastern Massachusetts. So the next two are kind of related to that. We really don't have housing development capacity in Franklin County. We have um, planners, and the planners can help with zoning and doing housing production plan. And then we have the regional housing authority that can manage housing once it's built, but we're missing right that thing in between, which is helping the towns develop housing. I just wanted to give Bill an opportunity to give this perfect example yeah. that is happening right now in Irving. Yep. We, um, we formed um, a committee to look at senior housing and to um, put out an RFP for senior housing, and we, we did that, and we got no response from anyone. Sewer, water, Ooh, sidewalk, sewer, already in place. Water, oh, wow. And, <laughs> and I was, I, um, 60 I'm, units. Yep. Um, I sit on the board of Rural Development, Inc., which is the housing, a housing development arm of the Franklin Housing Authority, and was in a meeting with 10 developers talking about that project and they all said it's just not big enough. It just it just isn't really worth it to us, which unbelievable. <laughs> and and, and it, it's, it's crazy. huge. It's crazy. Right? <laughs> yeah. To us it's huge. And, yes. And, and, what it, and with sewer and water and community. with town on the land, even with that, they were like, yeah, no, it's not worth it to oh. us. Okay. And so we just we've got to change something there. Um Home ownership, year-round home, home, home ownership, less of an issue in Franklin County, huge issue, Berkshires, Cape Cod, and the islands. Mm -hmm. And then we really need more flexibility in state programs to be, make those programs available and competitive for us in rural communities. So that's a flavor of the rural policy plan. What did we just do? Four of the focus areas? There's 11 more. Hmm. Go on the COG website, read them. One thing that I would look at on this is state regulations on a variety of subjects, which may make sense in Boston and the East, yep. but make no sense out yep. here. And um, act. Is it um, one of the, the recommendations in the municipal financial constraints chapter is that there be a cost analysis before mm -hmm. legislation is passed. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that it is an, an analysis of what is the impact on municipalities, especially rural municipalities, before a new program or policy is passed. And that one doesn't go backwards, but it would go forward. Isn't that sort of what unfunded mandate is? No. Because <laughs> un unfunded mandate is something that the state tells you to do it, and it, but then you have to prove how much it's going to cost, and that's a big problem. So the analysis is on us. Yeah, the analysis is on us, exactly. Right. And then, and then you know, how can you get the analysis on something that hasn't taken place yet? Exactly. And it's, it's a, a 
circular thing and you really can't figure it out. But uh, I think that's a great idea though. Well the good thing is this governor and his administration are receptive to hearing the less is more song. Uh, sometimes you get administrations that aren't, but I think that Baker is open-minded to that, you know, if you make the case, and Karen Polito definitely is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that reminds me that I forgot to tell you another uh, win for the Rural Policy Advisory Commission is that um, with every change in governor, with every new term, gubernatorial term, there is a legislative requirement that the state's economic development plan be redone. It's now called Opportunities for All. And um, there are public hearings going on around Massachusetts, but there will be, for the first time, a focus on rural issues. And there will be a specific meeting on rural economic development issues for the statewide economic development plan. Which is great. But isn't that part of the problem? So every administration changed the next one you could be off yeah. and there won't be a committee to our world? Well, that to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's why we need the Office of Rural Policy. Yes. At a cabinet level. At a cabinet level. Yeah. Fine. Great governor. Keep him in there for your life. <laughs> <laughs> so do please read the chapters and get back to us with any comments. This, um, we hope that this really will shine a light on that it's hard, it's hard in rural communities and that there are a lot of them in Massachusetts and we need to rethink how we think about things. We're not just Boston. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Uh -huh. Okay, do we have any business not anticipated 48 hours in advance? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank One, two. Yeah! yeah.